Listen to me now. If you've got something, oh shabandi. If you got something that's weighing on your heart, some kind of burden, a prayer request, something you've been believing God for. I believe God is interrupting our plan here today. Yes. If you've got something before the Lord, I just want us to just flood this altar. And I believe the Spirit of the Lord is saying, victory is right at hand. Just cry out to him. We don't need anybody to lay hands on you. Just, just cry out to him. He's the healer. He's the deliverer. Come on, just press in as close as you can. We're one big happy family. This is the body of Christ. If you feel led, you can lay hands on somebody else just to agree with them. And we're believing God for deliverance. You got to watch it on the computer through the internet. The same spirit of the anointing that's in this house is right where you are. Get up out of that bed. Get up off of that couch and worship him. If you're in your car and watching it on your, on your device, Pull over to the side of the road and give God the praise that's due. I'm telling you, the, the Lord of hosts is in the house. The Lord of hosts is in the house. We send healing. We send the power of the Holy Ghost to go and arrest wayward loved ones wayward children backslidden preachers we command you to wake up out of your sleep in the name of Jesus now unto him that is able do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask of him according to the power that works within us somebody gotta praise him somebody ought to worship him he's already doing it he's already doing it come on cry out to him already doing it. He's already doing it. Oh, he's doing it right now. Now it's time for the life-changing Word of God. This week, Bishop Keith begins a three-week series reminding us that God is really interested in everything concerning us. As we study the Bible, there is a theme carried through the entire Word of God where He expects us to move towards surrendering all. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
that doesn't leave anything out. In this message, Bishop Keith begins to challenge us to rethink how we view the definition of ownership. The truth is, God is the owner. We are the stewards. Anything we give to God is simply a return of what already belongs to Him. If we understand this, it's easier to give Him what He requests. Please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 14 for today's message entitled, He Wants It All. To open our sermon today, I just want to say that all pastors want their churches to grow. Care where they are, what city they live in, how big the town is, all pastors want their churches to grow. Of course, in the kingdom, success, of course, can be measured in a number of ways. And certainly in the natural, this is this is true as well. Just want to run down a few of them. This is not exhaustive, but I just want to talk to you just a minute uh, about some concepts here. Uh, number one. The gathering of crowds and having members. That's uh, not the sign of success, but it is a, a sign that something is going on. It's not the only thing, uh, but it is a sign. In other words, um, when you think of somebody like Joel Osteen, uh, he has his detractors, he has his haters and all of that. But uh, the question can be asked to any pastor in America, uh, when's the last time you preached to 50,000 people? Every Sunday. <laughs> and we understand that, uh, like I said before, the gathering of crowds is not the only thing, but it is a measurement. I believe that anything that is alive is going to grow. Say amen, somebody. That's one of the definitions of life, actually. Uh, number two, being financially prosperous is another sign of success, so to speak. And I'm talking about ministry in particular right now. And so uh, if you're able in, in a church or in a ministry to pay your bills and, and to have a staff and have the lights on and have some heat and air conditioning in the summertime, all those kinds of things. I know we don't like to think about this all the time, but uh, t there is a practical aspect to ministry. There is a reality. I mean, I've said this many, many times over the years uh, when we get in these kinds of circles and, and these kinds of subjects uh, when we're preaching. Listen, you can't go down to Indiana and Michigan and speak in tongues and tell them to keep your lights on. You better have some cash. You better pay that bill. You better, better speak in tongues with a check in your hand. Something you're going to have to do because eventually if that time runs out, you're going to be in the dark. Say amen, somebody. So being financially prosperous is another sign. Uh, number three, and this one I, I really like, the developing of people and sending them out in ministry. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we don't look at this so much because uh, not everybody is going to pastor a mega church. I said amen. Uh, uh, there are all kinds of factors that go into whether or not a church will get to mega status. And just so you know, the definition of mega uh, in America is supposed to be uh, if you have 2,000 people uh, worshiping on a weekend. So if, if you have 2,000 people uh, as a part of your church on a weekend that's gathering together, that's considered a mega church. Now, uh, understand that there are all kinds of factors. If you're in a city the size of Muncie... Amen. That's going to be challenging just because of the sheer numbers of people. I'm a firm believer. I can't prove this, and so don't hold me to it. But I believe if Destiny Christian Center just could just be picked up and transplanted into Atlanta or Houston or Dallas or someplace like that, we would already be two or 3,000. It's because of the sheer numbers of people that you have access to and being able to minister to those uh, that are lost in those particular regions. And, and so uh, we understand all that, but developing people is a big deal. So if you're in Muncie, Indiana, or Anderson, or Marion, or uh, some smaller city, and you are a pastor believing God, preaching the gospel, 
developing people. Uh, your church may not get to a thousand people, but you may be turning over ministry. You may be launching people out. You may be uh, training evangelists to go out and preach the gospel around the world. That, I believe, is a sign of success, even if your church is 100 people. Of course, in America, it becomes a little bit more difficult because we're so supersize everything, you know, and there's been some pushback on that, and I believe uh, some of the fast food restaurants have kind of backed off of some of that because of all the criticism with obesity in our nation, but the bottom line is we measure things by numbers. We measure things oftentimes by bigness, and there is some relevance to that, and that is relevant in terms of being one of the signs of growth, but developing people and sending them out is another sign. Lastly, and this is one that I believe, uh, true success really has to do with fulfilling God's intended purpose for you. Like I said before, uh, this does not go just for pastors, this is for everybody. If, if, if you uh, are a kingdom person, if you are saved, if you are Holy Ghost filled, if you uh, are a child of God, God has placed you here for a reason. And I believe the ultimate success is not in the numbers. The ultimate success is not being wealthy. The ultimate success is not even developing people and sending them out, except that if that is the principal purpose that God has brought you here. And so success really can be measured in your own mind and by the mind of God in terms of doing what God has called you to do. So even as a pastor, I can't get so caught up in numbers and caught up in finances and caught up in developing people and sending them out uh, that I lose the fact that perhaps God has assigned me to something else. Perhaps he's measuring whether or not I am faithful to what he's called me to do. Are you still here? And I believe Jesus was really only interested in this last one. I believe that was the only thing that he really cared about is fulfilling the call of God. Look at John chapter 4 verse 31. He says, meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. What, what is he saying? He's saying, what drives me? What energizes me? What gets me going? Is knowing that I'm doing what my father has called me to do. Don't get caught up in all this other stuff. Making sure that I obey the one that sent me. Listen now. We're starting a new series. For three weeks entitled, It's About Jesus. Everybody say, It's About Jesus. And so today, in this message, I want to challenge us to put things in the right perspective. By reminding us that, here's, here's the message, he wants it all. And I want you to declare it so that you hear your own self say it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let's say it together. He wants it all. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your presence. We thank you for the spirit of God that we sense in this place. Let your will be done. Let this word come forth with great power and anointing to heal and to set free. Send the spirit of the breaker in this place in the name of Jesus. We submit to you now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Our opening text really is found in Luke chapter 14. So I want to read several verses here. I'm going to take my time through here so that we actually hear the word of the Lord. I'm going to be reading in the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Luke chapter 14, starting at verse 25. It reads like this. Now large crowds were traveling with him. He turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father 
and mother, wife, and children, brothers, and sisters. Yes, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. Verse 33. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. So far the scripture. Jesus is bringing revelation into this situation. He's saying a lot of things. I don't have time to go through every little thing, so I'm going to pull some things out of here uh, to prayerfully give us some revelation on what he wants us to hear in this day and time. Of course, we are in the stewardship teaching time of year. <laughs> every January, unless God says something different, we uh, preach messages dealing with stewardship. It just means uh, being a manager, someone who is a steward over somebody else's things. And as uh, we said in our opening in the sermon bump, uh, that uh, we are not really owners of anything. God owns everything. He said the cattle on a thousand hills is mine. He said the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. Do you dwell therein? So God owns you too. <laughs> So everything that you see, God is the owner. But we are the stewards, and it's important for us to understand what stewardship really is all about. So I, uh, I try to deal with financial stewardship every January. Every time uh, January rolls around, we know we're going to get messages having to do with our stewardship and our faithfulness uh, in these financial areas. Now, here it is. If you don't understand God's heart, this series of messages can be kind of worrisome. <laughs> if we don't really understand what God is saying in his word, when you continue to hear about stewardship, finances, and money, it can tend to get on your nerves. But I just believe that anytime God is trying to get something to us, he challenges us to give in some kind of way. I'm reminded of a, of a story, and it's, it's detailed in Mark's gospel, chapter 10. We're not going to go there. Uh, but I, I remember when a young man, you'll remember this, a young man came to Jesus and says, uh, listen, what, uh, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? In other words, what must I do to be saved, so to speak? And he already had some things in his mind, and uh, Jesus rattled off some commandments and things like, hey, I've, I've done all of that. I've kept all of those things uh, from my youth. He was kind of feeling kind of good. I, I think he was probably genuine in, in, in his approach. But Jesus said, listen now, uh, the Bible, and this is really key in, in uh, chapter 10, verse 21, uh, the Bible says Jesus beheld him, loved him. Everybody say loved him. Jesus loved him and said, one thing you lack. You've done all this stuff, but here's one thing that you lack. Go sell everything you've got and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Wow. Are, are you kidding me? That's what Jesus is saying here? Yeah. 
So listen now, money is a means to an end. It's not the end, but it's a means to an end. Money is not the root of all evil. It's often misquoted that way. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of it is the root of all evil. Listen, you can love money and not have a dime in your pocket. <laughs> so it has nothing to do with rich or poor. It has nothing to do with finances as it relates to how much you have. It has to do with your heart and your approach toward money. So it seems clear in our text as we shift that Jesus isn't really concerned uh, with a big crowd. The Bible here in our text starts out saying that large crowds followed him. And, and I had my opening statements uh, placed there for, for a particular purpose because now we as preachers, we, we like crowds. <laughs> we, we like somebody that's listening to us. We like uh, every now and then, we like somebody to say amen. Y'all kind of slow, but anyway, we like somebody to say amen every now and then. Amen. Amen just, just means it, it, it is so or I agree or something to that effect. And so it always helps preachers. You know, I'm not necessarily uh, a loud hooping kind of guy. It's not necessarily uh, my mode. But, you know, every now and then I still like to hear some feedback. And you're free to do that at any point in time. So uh, when we have a, a crowd of people uh, when we're speaking to, we, we like to, to hear something back. Yeah, we like crowds. And large crowds follow Jesus all the time. This is why we have to know what our purpose is because we can be distracted from the principal thing that God has called us to do and say if we get caught up in the crowd. <laughs> For preachers, crowds can speak of success, as I mentioned earlier. Now, oftentimes, you know, I'll be with some of my colleagues and and they'll ask questions about how many people you have in your church and, and they're, they're feeling pretty good about how things are moving and all those things uh, in their church. It's just kind of a, a preacher thing. But we, have, we all have these things in our life uh, that we feel good about as it relates to whether or not God's favor is upon our life and whether or not we're in his will. But crowds, listen now, crowds can be an area of Temptation as well. Because crowds can tempt us, listen now, to compromise what God is telling us to do. And I'll just make this statement because things have changed from what I would consider to be the olden days. I'm not that old, but uh, several years ago, maybe a couple of decades ago, things seemed to be a little different. And uh, people seem to be able uh, to understand that you need to stick to some stuff. In this day and time, uh, you know, you can, you can say, okay, I want to paint the wall purple. Half the church might leave. Make one wrong move, one wrong statement. Music's too loud. Music's not loud enough. Screen's not working this week. <laughs> As pastors, we are thinking about these things all of the time because, after all, we are leading people. But I want you to know that there's always, even for individuals, I haven't always been a pastor, for individuals there's always, listen now, there's always a temptation to compromise. And compromise just means to come down from the standard that you know God has set for you. And I'm just here to tell you, don't, don't go by what everybody else is doing. Don't go by what everybody else is saying. You know what God has called you to do. Well, God commissioned this guy named Jeremiah to preach to the nations. And Jeremiah tried to disqualify himself because God was telling him some things, and he was just a young boy, really, at this time, and so the assignment seemed so big. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 1, starting at verse 7. It says, but the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. 
Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Now, so you ask yourself the question, why would Jeremiah be afraid? Why would God have to, to say that to him? And the reason is the message that Jeremiah had to deliver was not a pleasant one. He was a boy and he could, he could sense the fact that uh, this was going to be not some mamsy-pamsy assignment. This is something that God is going to send me into high places. I'm sending you to the nations. So God in his omniscience is saying, listen, don't be afraid. I'm telling you this in advance because it's not going to get, uh, you're not going to get all the amens every week. You're not always going to get the cheers. Everybody's not going to say amen. Everybody's not going to jump and say, oh, come on, preach it, Jerry. Verse 16 says, and I will, this is God speaking, and I will utter my judgments against them for all their wickedness in forsaking me. They have made offerings to other gods and worship the works of their own hands. But you, listen now, gird up your loins, stand up, and tell them everything that I command you. Do not break down before them, or I will break you before them. Let me stop there just for a minute. What God is saying is, listen, uh, there's going to be some trials. There's going to be some challenges. There's going to be some haters. There's going to be some people that are not going to want to hear from me. And since you're the one delivering the message, you're going to have to take the brunt of the criticism. So God is saying, gird up yourself, stand up straight. You say what I tell you to say. Don't you back off. Don't you compromise. Don't you start crying like a little boy or I'll break you down right in front of everybody. Whew. <laughs> That's pretty heavy for a little guy. Listen now. And here's God, verse 18. And for my part, this is God saying this. <laughs> I have made you today a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its princes, its priests, and all the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. Whoo, that's, that's exciting for me. Because what he's saying is, Jerry, I don't care what I tell you to tell those people. I got your back. Whether they like it or whether they don't like it, whether they want to hear it or whether they're not, I know there's going to be some haters. There's going to be some people that are even going to fight against uh, what you're saying to them because of me, but I got your back. I've made you a fortified city. I've set you in stone. I've stand, stood you up. You'll be able to handle it because I got your back. Listen now, the reward for resisting compromise, listen, is godly success. There is always a reward for doing the will of God. There's always something that God has in mind for your sacrifice. You know, we're in a fasting time, a, a fasting and prayer time. And, and so, you know, most of us are, are not vegetarians. I know we got some hiding up in here. <laughs> Most of us are not. And so when the pastor calls a fast, we have to make a decision whether or not we're going to submit to the body of Christ or whether or not we're going to do our own thing. Well, I don't feel led to go on a fast right now. The devil is a lie. Quit lying. God places a person as the head of the church. If you're a part of the church, you ought to be part of the fast. I said amen. Now, fasting is not something that any of us really love to do. Most of us are, are, are not loving this. <laughs> I want a sandwich right now. Doggone it. <laughs> Woo, and I'll just tell you right now, I am a carnivore. Yes, 
I guess I'm really an omnivore officially, but hey, I'm more carna than omna. I'll just, I'll just let you know. <laughs> but here's the thing. There's always a reward if you don't compromise. God's got something in mind on the other side. And so if we, if we push our plate back, if we sacrifice during this uh, these period of time, uh, 21 days, now 14, of course, uh, if we sacrifice here, there's something on the other side of that. Hmm. When you obey God, God's always got something in mind. Listen now, it's not just for the preachers, it's for all of us. Verse 33, so therefore none of you can become my disciple if you do not Give up all your possessions. Now, why in the world would Jesus say such a thing? I, I can't be your disciple if I don't give up everything. That's true. Because he wants it all. And it's not a literal, I have to bring everything to the church. I have to give all of my money. I have to cash in all of my, my cash. I have to cash in my retirement. All. That's not what he said. He's saying, listen, uh, I want everything that's in you. And it starts with what is in your heart the most, which is usually your resources. So Jesus is saying, listen, you can't be my disciple. He, he starts out his statement. This is how we know that Jesus wasn't concerned about crowds. The Bible starts out saying, and you got to look at the little things, uh, the crowds followed him. And most of the time when you got the crowds following him, you know, I've been in preacher's rooms. Yeah, come on, let's kill him, Doc. What is that? Jesus wasn't concerned about any of those kinds of things because he had all these people following him and he starts out saying, oh, by the way, nobody can be my disciple unless you hate your father, your mother, your wife, your husband, your kids, and even your own life. That's a way to stop a revival. <laughs> Jesus wasn't concerned about crowds. He was only concerned with pleasing his father. Listen now, if you're not willing to hold your possessions loosely, you can't be a disciple of Christ. If you love your stuff more than you love him, you can't really be a disciple because he wants it all. Listen now, most of the time, if he has your checkbook, he has you. As the pastor of this church, I have to be the one to remind us of what Jesus has said in his word. Verse 33, sell your possessions, this is Luke 12, and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Also, <laughs> Whew. what he's saying is the things you spend your money on, that's where your heart really is. You say you love God? I can look in your checkbook to find out how much you really love it. If you don't write checks, money orders, that's fine. <laughs> Bank accounts, all of that. He's saying, listen, wherever your treasure is. Your heart follows where your treasure is. I find it very interesting, and I, I've, I've been a pastor a long time, been a lead pastor for coming up on nine years, and I, I've seen this over the years, even as, as I've been a, an associate pastor in a couple of different churches. It, it's interesting to me, it's, it, it's an interesting phenomenon that our tithers, listen now, our tithers and consistent givers are our most faithful members too. It's not 100%. It's not exclusive. It's not, it's not to, the, to the point of every single person. But generally speaking, that's true. 
The people who are faithful in their tithing, the people who are faithful in their giving, the people who are faithful uh, in their support financially are the same people that we got to count on to do everything around him. That's why we're always asking for volunteers. That's why we're always asking you, hey, hey, can you volunteer in this area because we have all these people and most people don't volunteer. Hmm. Are you still here? Listen, here's another way to put what I just said. Here's what, here, here's what Jesus said. Your heart is loyal to what you spend your money on. It's another way to look at it. Whatever you spend your resources on, that's where your heart really is. Now, I'm talking about mostly the, your disposable income. There are certain things that we have to spend. You got to have some place to stay. You got to have uh, heat and, and cooling and all that, those kinds of things. But after all of that, where do you spend your resources? That determines really where your heart really is. Hmm. And I'm sensing this year, we need to really begin to enjoy our salvation. I don't want to encourage you. And you're thinking, man, that's a, that's a curveball. No, it's not. Because when you begin to enjoy your salvation, you'll begin to enjoy your God. When you begin to enjoy your God, you're going to be like Jesus. You're going to want to please him in every way. Because he's the one that wrote it. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And so uh, if you enjoy your salvation, you enjoy your walk, you serve Jesus, as my friend Kevin Woodgett says, when you serve Jesus with a smile. I don't know about you, but serving Jesus is wonderful for me. I don't regret anything in the world. I don't want to go back. I don't miss none of that stuff. In simplicity, listen now, if God says it, just do it. You don't have to analyze it. You don't have to fast and pray a long time. If God has said it, just obey what he says. And when giving financially, listen now, think of it as our theme is for 2015. I get to do this. I don't have to do it. God's not probably going to strike me dead if I don't. But I get to do this. I get to sow into the kingdom of God. I have the awesome opportunity to know that God owns everything and he shared his abundant blessings with me. I owe it to him to be a blessing. Jesus wants it all, but he begins with where you need it the most. And I know to some of you, I'm preaching to the choir. Some of you, this is not even an issue. Well, it may be that God is coming after you in another area because he wants it all, not just possessions and money and all that kind of stuff. He wants the whole of your heart. He wants your lifestyle. Are you still here? But if God can get your money, usually, he can get the rest of you. <laughs> if Jesus was concerned with the big crowd that was following him, whether or not they would hang out, whether or not they say, go preacher, he wouldn't have said what he said. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying that if God says it, that's what we need to do. See, I think we have too much knowledge, too much information, too many things going on all the time. I purposely decided during this 21-day fast that I was going to stop looking at Facebook. Now, you know, I'm not hating if, if, if what I said in the... In the um, Guidelines was just try to keep it to a minimum. I, I get that. So it's not a, a prohibition. I'm saying what I, I decided to do. And because what, the reason why I decided to do it is because that, that phone can control you. 
you say, well, Pastor, you know, I got I to gotta stay on top of things. You know, I do my business through my Facebook and through my email and my Instagram and my Twitter and all that stuff. You know, if I don't look at it, then, you know, I'm going to lose customers. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm just saying that phone can control your life. And, you know, I, I know at the time that Paul said this, uh, he didn't know anything about cell phones and uh, emails and all that kind of stuff. But he said, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. I believe it could have said if he was living now, that message would have included, do not be drunk with social media. Do not be drunk with all kinds of media. Wherein is it excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Anything that you can't put down for five minutes, that's a problem. What am I saying? I'm saying that there has to be some restraint. There has to be decisions made. If we understand that he wants it all, he wants everything. That's why I've got my depiction up there. He wants your heart mostly, but your heart heart is tied to the stuff. Some of you in this room today are cool with the tithing and offering. I've been tithing for over 30 years. I've seen the blessing of it. I know there's lots of controversy and lots of people that are coming against this principle. Fine. Don't do it. But the word of God is very clear about it. And the body of Christ has affirmed this principle. But there's something going on in your heart. Something going on. Because Jesus is very clear in his teaching when he says, if you identify what's going on with your money, then I find out where I really stand. Jesus says some hard stuff, like you can't serve God and mammon at the same time. In other words, you, you, you can't really serve God if he doesn't have your wallet. <laughs> so he uses these principles to get at the thing that we have the tendency to withhold. Listen now, I'm done. In the next few weeks, we're really talking about some principles in the word of God to help us to be reminded for some of us and to prayerfully push some of us over the edge of the deception that we've had because we've got all this revelation, we've got all this knowledge, we've got all these things that are bombarding our minds and we're leaving the, just the simple principles that are in the word. And so I just want to remind us today. It's my assignment. You know, I'd rather preach Daniel in the, nine, in the lion's den. <laughs> because when Daniel comes out, you know, we don't have any lion's dens around here. <laughs> when Daniel comes out victorious, everybody shouts, runs, and Sometimes God has to say some hard things just to get at what's on the inside. And he opens us up. Just like he did that young man. You've done all these things. You kept the commandments. You've been faithful in all these things. One thing you lack. Jesus said, I love you, but here's what you need to do. Sell everything you got and give to the poor. In other words, what Jesus was saying, he was, that wasn't a command for everybody. That was his issue. I don't know what your issue is, but this morning God is saying, I don't want a part-time disciple. I don't want a fair weather 
another disciple. I, I don't want a, a disciple that doesn't have any kind of backbone at all. I feel the pressure. Not from him. But the spirit of the Antichrist is in the earth. And he wants us to back off of what the word of God says. And preach, as Paul describes, another gospel. A gospel that's easy. A gospel that's without sacrifice. A gospel where uh, uh, there's no, no demands placed on our lifestyle. And as a pastor, I'm sensitive to that. I made my opening statements because I want my church to grow too. I know it's Jesus' church. I understand that. You understand what I mean. I want mega just like everybody else. I believe that's where we're headed. But I don't want to be mega if we got a church full of folks with no power. I don't want mega if we got to get to mega when I say, listen, I, I need you to sit down and shut up. And it went, huh, well, I feel led to go to another church. That's the time that we're living in. I want God to help us be an army that we'll fight for one another, literally be willing to die for one another because of the call of God on our lives. I've had a conversation with Jesus here recently. I'm willing to die for this thing. Not up here playing. We're, we're not trying to gather people just so we can say, well, <laughs> well, you know, my church. Oh no. Eternity is at hand. And we've got a God that we're going to stand before. The Bible says, I'm going to be judged more harshly than all of you because I'm leading people. So I got to tell you the truth. And hey, I understand we're in a stewardship series, but I'm shifting now as we've getting, getting to the closing of this message and to the altar call. When we, when we say he wants it all, he wants, listen now, he wants you. If he really gets you, he got your money. He's got your time. He's got your attitude. So I want to encourage you this morning. You say, Pastor, this wasn't no encouraging message. Yes, it was. Because God can cut us off without even telling us to get straight. So anytime God says, okay, Keith, I, I need you to tighten some stuff up, I'm thankful. Because God could cut me off and not tell me a thing.